Good evening, everyone. Today is July 13th at 6 p.m. in the evening. Today's class will be instructed by Kayla Nixon and it's on uterine care. Um, Kayla works at Rush University Medical Center, my employer, and she volunteered to do this class for us. And without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Kayla to do her own introduction. Hello, Kayla. I thank you, Cassandra, for that intro. Um, I apologize in advance that um, a lot of my slides will actually have Northwestern on them because I'm just like wrapping up my fellowship there, which is in minimally invasive gynecologic surgery, which is sort of a focus on complex benign gynecology. Um, and that includes uterine fibroids and endometriosis, ovarian cysts, really the really severe problems are like the more complex ones um, that a lot of other like general gynecologists don't often do or see as often like those are the um, the it's really what my fellowship was created for and so um, I'll be starting at Rush technically in September um, but given that you know I have a specific interest in uterine fibroids and it's fibroid awareness month the month of July um, that's predominantly what I'll be talking about tonight um, so forgive that. And I just wanted to also say, feel free to interrupt me with questions as we go along. I'm, um, uh, like never averse to being interrupted. So if you want to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask a question, um, or if something is particularly of interest, um, and you want me to go in more detail, just let me know. I'm very happy to just keep it flexible. Um, okay. So again, the objectives are predominantly focused on fibroids because that's really the most common um, pathology of the uterus. One of the most common, um, well, the most common indication for hysterectomies has historically been because of uterine fibroids. Um, and um, I wanted to go over that mostly since that's um, sort of the month that we're commemorating right now. Um, we'll start by talking about the prevalence of fibroids and some population health statistics around them talk about the symptoms and the findings that are often seen with fibroids, um, describe some of the diagnostic methods um, to confirm that they're there and the severity of them, and then to describe the management options and the treatments for fibroids. Um, so as I mentioned, uterine fibroids are the most common pelvic tumor in women. They are benign. So when we're talking about fibroids specifically, we're talking about the benign tumors of the uterus, smooth muscle tumors of the muscle layer of the uterus. There are cancers of the uterus of those same muscle tissues, but in general, you know, they look a lot like fibroids, but they wouldn't be called fibroids. Like after surgery, if we found out that that was a cancer, it's no longer a fibroid. Fibroids are benign. We, um, they say monoclonal tumors on here, and all that means is it's a medical way of saying that one smooth muscle cell starts to replicate itself. It just um, divides and divides. And um, usually it's a lot of the, the muscle layer of the uterus. So the uterus has a few different layers. The inner layer, the endometrium is where you have a period from. So that's what grows and sheds every month and where you, the bleeding comes from. The muscle layer is what contracts whenever you you're having cramps along with your period, but also whenever you're um, pregnant and um, needing to contract to deliver a baby, that's from the muscle layer. And then there's an outer layer that's sort of like a skin layer over the outside. Um, so uterine fibroids are a tumor of that muscle layer. They're predominantly, we see them in reproductive age women, and that is because they are hormonally stimulated. So they grow under the influence of hormones, which are usually estrogen and progesterone. Those are the the most common hormones that are in female, biologically female um, people. And um, fibroids often grow, particularly when you're nearing the menopausal age, the average age of menopause being 51. Um, a lot of those hormone levels are changing a lot. So because of those changes, sometimes the fibroids grow and start to cause more problems, particularly around that age group, but they are often seen in anyone who's of reproductive age. 
And then the pro predominant symptoms, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, as we go along, are abnormal uterine bleeding, which is also abbreviated AUB, um, or AUBL means abnormal uterine bleeding associated with leiomyomas, which are, that's the medical term for fibroids, bulk or pressure symptoms, and then some reproductive implications. So fibroids are very common tumors. Um, they're at least 9.2 per 1,000 women. So of all the women that exist, that many per year um, will be diagnosed with fibroids per 1,000. Um, for Black women, it's higher, like three um, times that much. Um, and then as I sort of mentioned, they increase with age. So you'll see them more frequently in women ages like 40 to 44 than you will in someone um, 25 to 29 or something um, sometime earlier. Um, for women in their late 40s, again, um, by that point, a lot of women up to even over 80% of black women, but up to about 70% of white women are suspected to have fibroids. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are causing problems or require surgery or any medication or anything, but just their presence is usually um, that at least that much. The um, This little note just says like studies of hysterectomies that were done, if they took a, a uterus out for any reason at all, so it could be for pain, for endometriosis, for any reason, at least 80% of them, 70 to 80% are um, reported to have fibroids found on the pathology. So they're very common. Um, some of the risk factors associated with fibroids include race. So we've already kind of touched on that, how um, essentially um, it is very common, particularly among Black women, where we often have earlier onset of symptoms, sometimes four to six years sooner than white women of the same age, um, and a higher rate of hysterectomy, so needing um, some sort of like definitive surgery because of the symptoms and the burden of fibroids is more common. There's maybe an increased risk of them in like Latina, Latinx individuals and with Asians, it's really comparable to white women, um, which is still, you know, a, a common, but not necessarily more. Um, there was this medication, um, DES. It was a, a medication that some women in the, the 50s mostly um, were given to treat um, like prenatal uh, nausea and vomiting or nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. Um, and so women who were, uh, their moms were taking that medication. So if you were a female and you were in utero uh, and, and your mom took that medication called DES, there's a higher risk of a lot of different things. Usually there's the risk of uterine abnormalities. So the shape of the uterus should be off, um, but there's also a higher risk of fibroids when that's the case. Obesity, hypertension, those are associated with fibroids. And then things like your diet, particularly red meat and alcohol have been associated with fibroids. Some of it is maybe because of hormones, you know, obesity. Um, when we are overweight, all of our fat cells actually make estrogen. Um, and so that can cause problems with bleeding, that can cause growth of fibroids and things like that. And when you think about your diet, like a lot of the process, maybe like more animal-based foods will also have some of the hormones in them. Um, and so maybe that's part of why, but it's really unclear as to why that is. Um, the decrease, it, the things that decrease your risk, however, are um, having babies. So parity basically just means um, if you've gotten pregnant and carried a pregnancy to term, then um, there's a lower risk of um, having fibroids. If you use progestin-only birth control pills and um, or birth control types, and it's a little unclear as to why that is, a thought is that maybe what, what happens is your fibroids are predominantly, the progestin is the most common reason what, that, why they're stimulated to grow. Um, so, but the, the birth control actually quiets down your body's um, making of progesterone. Um, so it's thought that like maybe that could reduce the risk a little bit. And then another other diet types, so like vegetables, vitamin D. Um, it's unclear why smoking actually leads to a decreased risk, but it does. So uh, that's just a, a little fun fact there. I wouldn't ever encourage anyone to smoke to prevent fibroids, but <laughs> one way to potentially um, 
just one protective effect of it. So it's not exactly understood why fibroids grow. And here are some pictures of them. Um, this is a large one fibroid, and then this is a bunch of smaller fibroids attached to the uterus. Um, but it's likely it's thought that there are two common processes as to why that happens. So the first thought is that like a muscle cell in the uterus gets some kind of mutation that leads um, to the growth of fibroids. So that's sort of the first thing, like or it, it basically makes um, the fibroid grow abnormally in response to hormones, but how big it gets and how, how that happens is really unclear. So that's sort of the first part is that something causes the muscle cell to change where it grows in response to hormones. And then the second part of that process is to for it to grow so much like that it becomes a tumor essentially. So there are some muscle cells that might grow into tiny little fibroids that never become problems. So maybe they're just going through the first part of that process, but then something else happens where, um, you know, they grow really, really large up to, you know, as big as what we see in these pictures here. And that's thought to be a separate process. I already mentioned that they're hormonally mediated. So, um, oftentimes progesterone, which is the predominant hormone um, that's thought to be related to fibroid growth, um, is a little bit more than estrogen, but both ha are, have receptors um, and they can be under the um, influence, they can grow under the influence of both. And it's commonly known that the fibroids will shrink after menopause. So again, what menopause is, is basically where your body, your ovaries stop making the same level of hormones enough to give you a period every month. It's not like an on off switch. So whenever you go into menopause, it doesn't mean that suddenly your ovaries are not making any hormones. It's much more of a slow decline in the hormone production. But menopause, we consider, we actually diagnose it one year after you've stopped having periods. And it just means that your ovarian function has declined to the point where you're not having regular monthly cycles. Um, Another thing that we see with fibroids are they have a lot of increased blood flow to them. Um, so this just angiogenesis is a medical word for growth of blood vessels. So they encourage new blood vessels to form into the tumors. So the surgery is to take them out. Blood, blood loss and bleeding is one of the um, risks of them, but also some of the things that women might experience is heavy period bleeding because of fibroids. So we, as gynecologists and gynecologic surgeons, we classify the fibroids. Hey, Ma. Yeah. Hey, um, someone asked a question. Latrice, did you answer her question? She said, oh. is it connected to endometriosis? That is a great question. And thank you for pointing that out to me. I wasn't um, able to, I didn't have the chat pulled up. So if you could That's stop okay. me at any time that there are questions, thank you. Okay. Um, but it's not connected to endometriosis. They are different diseases. Um, but I would say endometriosis is more, so that's where this lining inside the uterine cavity grows out through the fallopian tubes and can implant inside your abdomen and often on other like structures in the pelvis and the abdomen, but the tissue still grows and causes, um, bleeding internally and that leads to scarring and pain. So endometriosis is a different disease. It can cause, it usually causes more pain. Um, the fibroids usually cause more bleeding type of symptoms and sometimes just like bulk symptoms from the pressure. So it, it, sometimes you can see the two go hand in hand a little bit more commonly, but not always. Fibroids are so common, like, like I mentioned earlier on up to you know, 80 and plus percent of women will have fibroids. Endometriosis might be closer to like 15% of women, 12, I think it's like around 12 to 13%. So much less common, usually presents differently, but sometimes people can have both. So that's a great question. And thank you for asking and for letting me know there was a question. Um, so this, does that answer the question or yeah? Okay, I see a thumbs up. So hopefully that's a yes. <laughs> Um, this classification system kind of helps us as gynecologic surgeons think about what your symptoms might be based on where your fibroids are located. And so one type of, a type one, a type two, a type zero, these are called submucosal fibroids. 
So they basically mean that the fibroids are pushing into the inside of the uterine cavity and distorting the endometrial cavity. So these, this, this is the inside of the cavity is normally where a baby sits when you're pregnant. And so these types of fibroids can cause heavy bleeding because they, that's also where your period comes from, but they can also cause problems with fertility only usually when they're inside the cavity or they're so large that they're distorting the cavity. And a lot of the reasons for the fertility issues is because if you imagine a placenta trying to implant, you know, normally the endometrial tissue is soft, fluffy, vascular, encourages a placenta or, a, you know, an embryo to implant and start to flourish there. But this fiber tissue is hard, firm, really, um, you know, it's abnormal. So for any implantation that happens on the fibroid is unlikely to lead to a full-term pregnancy, more likely to lead to miscarriage. And so that's why these um, specifically submucosal fibroids can cause problems with infertility. Types, let me see, um, three, four, uh, three and four specifically are purely intramural. So that means they're within the wall of the, of the uterus and they have muscle tissue on both sides, basically. The third uh, type three, like maybe contacts the endometrium, but 100% of the tissue is still inside the wall of the uterus. And then type five, six, and seven, those are the ones where they're starting to push on the other side. So, you know, um, like basically into the belly, into the abdominal cavity. So those fibroids, especially when they're bigger, those are the ones that are more likely to cause what we call bulk symptoms. So one, if, you know, sometimes you can feel like there's something sitting on my bladder or there's something pushing into my right side of my pelvis. Um, there's something sitting on my rectum and I'm having a hard time going to the bathroom. There's like, it's like a blockage preventing me from having bowel movements normally. Um, those are more often seen typically with very large um, but also with subserosal fibroids. So these are the ones that are sitting on the outside of the uterus. Um, and then you can have some, we say like hybrid fibroids that are just so large that maybe they're impacting both, causing pain, causing bleeding, distorting the endometrium, maybe causing fertility. Those are rarer and usually they're typically like very large. And when I say large, you know, sometimes that might be like you know, five to 10 centimeters or higher, something like that. Um, so when we talk about the symptoms, I was kind of already alluding to that, but the three types that we typically see associated with fibroids um, are abnormal uterine bleeding or he heavy or prolonged menstrual bleeding, um, bulk symptoms. So that's the symptoms associated with pelvic pressure or pain, sort of a heaviness, a fullness. Some people will describe it like bloating or like they feel like they're pregnant. Um, and then reproductive symptoms. So infertility, pregnancy loss, miscarriage. Um, there can be some uh, problems associated with pregnancy when fibroids are there, which I'll touch on at the end. Um, but those are the predominant symptoms that we see. Submucosal fibroids, you know, they are the ones most often to cause heavy bleeding, sometimes anemia from so like any bleeding that's more than like soaking a pad an hour, every hour or a tampon every hour, you know, th that is to the point where we say like that's very abnormal, something should be done about that. If you're um, getting anemic because your period is so heavy from all the blood loss, um, you know, that's abnormal. Those are things that should always be evaluated. Um, the pressure symptoms sometimes can be, like I mentioned, urinary, it's sitting on my bladder, I feel like I have to pee a lot, or I can't quite get my bladder to empty, maybe the fiber is blocking part of the urine from coming out. Same with constipation, change in the shape or the caliber of your stool. Very rarely they can like sit on the blood vessels and cause some um, compression of the veins that normally would go back to your heart. And that sometimes can cause like blood clots and things in the legs or pain essentially there. Um, and then I sort of touched on the um, reproductive symptoms as well. Um, a little bit more about abnormal uterine bleeding, since I know this talk is more specific, more generally focused on uterine health. I did want to touch on other things that other pathologies that we see in the uterus. And as gynecologists, we always teach our medical students and things this little acronym that we call PALM-COIN. So PALM, this is the part 
pathologies that we see in the uterus that are associated with something structural. So if we do like an ultrasound or an MRI or something, we can see these things that, that are present. So that is an endometrial polyp, which is basically like a little skin tag inside the uterus. It is coming from the uterine, um, the endometrial layer. So again, that's the soft fluffy layer where your period comes from inside the part where the baby usually sits. And polyps are very common. They're also benign. They're usually removed um, in a, with a procedure called a hysteroscopy, which I'll talk about later as well. Adenomyosis is actually kind of similar to endometriosis. It's another um, pathology that we can see inside the uterus that can cause heavy bleeding, so abnormal bleeding, and also pain. And that is where this endometrial lining grows deep into the muscle layer of the uterus. And so it, it grows deep into the muscle layer, but it still responds like it would to your hormones. So um, like when you should have a period, that tissue bleeds and that blood is basically trapped inside the uterus. So that can cause pain, that can cause problems with fertility, just inflammation, things like that. Fibroids is leiomyoma, as I mentioned, is just another, the medical word for fibroids. And of course the M for malignancy, which, um, you know, is... Um, something that we always, that's always the first goal in any workup for abnormal bleeding. So any heavy menstrual bleeding, um, heavy or bleeding in between your periods, anything like that, we always want to make sure that we're not talking about a cancer. A lot of times a cancer of the uterus, that's the first way that it'll present is some abnormal bleeding. So again, I mentioned, especially like after menopause, any bleeding um, from the vagina, from the uterus should always be evaluated. Um, so then on this side, the coin with an extra E in there is um, basically describing the things that cause abnormal bleeding that are not related to a structural cause of the uterus, but some other phenomenon in the body. So the, a coagulopathy means a problem of the blood. So maybe the blood is not able to clot. Maybe there's some like platelets that are low or some clotting factors that are low. Sometimes liver disease can lead to that. Sometimes, um, you know, if you bleed enough, then it's like all of your blood. If you're, say you are in a really bad trauma, a really bad accident, some very severe wound and you have a lot of bleeding, it's almost like your body will use up all of your clotting factors. And then that's another type of a coagulopathy once you don't have, it's like your body can't keep up with what you need. So that is something that we sometimes see as presented as heavy or abnormal uterine bleeding. Ovulatory, the O stands for some sort of ovulation dysfunction. So the most common type of that is something like PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome. Basically, if you don't have periods every month or if you have irregular periods, a lot of the time that's related to your body not ovulating, your ovaries not ovulating. So ovulation is coming directly from the ovaries, and that means that you grew an egg that month, you released it, that's the ovulation, and then afterwards, your, that cyst that the ovary, that the egg is sitting in, normally starts to make a different type of hormone, progesterone, and then whenever that hormone is, um, once, once that cyst lifespan is over, that's when you get a period. So any irregular periods usually are pointing to some dysfunction of ovulation. Um, and it's really important to at least like ovulate, if not ovulate, to shed the lining inside the uterus probably once every three months at the minimum because that's what puts at, it can put you at risk for malignancies or cancers if you're not having regular periods. Any um, endometrial tissue that's just growing growing, growing, and then there's no trigger for it to shed, which is what ovulation does, then, you know, those cells are more likely to grow abnormally and to lead to some sort of um, ovulation dysfunction and potentially a cancer. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. There are other things. Um, endometrial sometimes means like maybe the endometrium is so thin and the bleeding is coming from that, just from that tissue being like not healthy enough, or maybe an infection or something like that. Iatrogenic means sometimes it, it can be the birth control or like a medication. So there's like an IUD sometimes that like a birth control pill is actually a very common cause of some abnormal bleeding, bleeding in between periods. And then they have this little catch-all for not otherwise classified 
Um, but when we talk about uterine health, you know, abnormal bleeding is probably one of the main things that um, is something to be aware of. And um, particularly, you know, um, just knowing your body is important, but also, you know, um, not a lot of women will suffer in silence and maybe not be as vocal or assume that it's normal to have like really heavy periods and um, to bleed in between periods or to bleed every day of a month or something like that. You know, they might just think that that's their normal. But I always encourage you to talk to a gynecologist if there's anything more bleeding any more than seven days, any heavier than like changing a pad once every two hours. Does that make sense? Is that, do y'all have any questions about that? I know that's a lot of information on one slide, but <laughs> all right. So back to fibroids, um, the most common um, way that they are evaluated is that we do, we can feel them on exam. So if we, if you were to come into the gynecology office, they would often feel your belly and usually do at least a bimanual exam with, which is like two fingers in the uterus, in the vagina and we push on the cervix, have one hand on the top of the belly and try to feel the size of the uterus. The size of the uterus we describe as if it were a pregnant uterus. So that's just a, a uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That's just how we describe it um, as a sort of like a function, you know, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, but, um, yeah, so it's either we just say like maybe it's similar to an eight week size uterus, similar to a 12 week, similar to 16 week size uterus um, as a, a convention. Is that the word? Just like by convention. That's the term I was looking for. Um, and 20 week size is at your belly button. So that means that if your uterus is up to your belly button, then, you know, that is functionally like you were to be about 20 weeks pregnant. And so um, that's sort of just how we, by convention, describe the size of the uterus. Then the next step is often to do an ultrasound. That's the gold standard first line of, um, of evaluation beyond um, the pelvic exam and clinic. Um, and usually it's done abdominally, but often also transvaginally. And if there are a lot of fibroids or a really large uterus or something that triggers, maybe we're planning for surgery, sometimes an MRI is also done um, to get more of a better picture of the fibroids. I will say CT scans are notoriously terrible at looking for fibroids. You can maybe see that they're there, but as far as whether how big they are or, um, you know, how... Um, if they're degenerating, you know, they're just not very good at looking um, at mostly anything in the pelvis, any cysts on the ovary or um, uterus um, pathologies, um, typically ultrasound or MRI is going to be better for us. Um, this is a ultrasound image here. So the first one was an ultrasound image of a large fibroid right here. I have another ultrasound image. So this is the lining inside of the uterus that we can see. Um, so that's the endometrial cavity. And sometimes you can see like this is a big fibroid that might be pushing up on that endometrial cavity here. And then I think I, I don't, we don't see anything. Oh, can you see this? Um, can you see the images on the right side of the screen? How about I can. Oh, maybe I'll have to swipe. I can. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> No, I um, I could go back to, let me see, because the other one was just like superimposed on top, like right here. Um, and it's just like this little green line is measuring that. So it's very small and maybe not easy to see, but this is an MRI image. It's much of a clearer picture. Um, here's there, there's a gel in the vagina that is a radio, like a radio lucent gel. And then the bladder is full here. So this white is the bladder. And then here's the cervix, and this is the inside of the uterine cavity. So the uterus is stretched, and there, this is the big fibroid on top right here. So that's um, the MRI gives us really the clearest picture of everything. You know, um, the ultrasound is kind of like static TV. I tell patients, and the MRI more like HD. So <laughs> a lot of times we prefer that if we're going to be doing surgery to remove the fibroids and that sort of thing. All right, let me keep going. So when it comes to treatment options, again, I mentioned early on fibers are so, so common. Oftentimes they don't really cause that 
many problems for people. So we only recommend treating if they're bothersome. Um, so the first question that we often ask, you have fibroids, so what? Are they bothering you? If not, do nothing about them, observe. And usually that means maybe not nothing, like maybe you'll get an ultrasound once every year or two to monitor, are they growing? Are they changing? Check, checking in with a gynecologist just to make sure um, if they are bothersome or start to become bothersome, you know, do you want to do something about them now? You know, so observation really means like check in with your doctor periodically, but you don't have to do medication surgery or anything else if they aren't bothering you. If they are bothering you, then it depends on um, how much, but also like what, what are, what are the main things that we want to improve? Do we want to improve the symptoms? If the symptoms, is it fertility related? Like, are we, are we treating any fertility problems? Are we treating any um, bleeding problems? And, and do you wanna maintain fertility? So what have your childbearing plans um, been like? And uh, or what, what are those desires in the future? A lot of times, if you want to potentially keep the idea of fertility on the table, certain procedures, we don't have good evidence to say that they are um, that they don't have an impact on, on um, fertility. So usually we try medications. Medications is the first line treatment for anyone with fibroids that are bothersome. And that typically will help if you're having bleeding symptoms. So a birth control pill is a very common way, sometimes an injectable medicine, sometimes an IUD. Those will predominantly help bleeding symptoms. If you have the pressure or the pain or bulk type symptoms, um, oftentimes like removing the fibroid or doing some sort of radiology therapy is desired. And then, um, you know, if you want to keep the uterus, you, you know, a lot of times um, there's surgical options and there is like a radiology procedure, even if you're not certain or not interested in pregnancy, some women are like, I just want, I don't want to have my uterus out. Like I would rather have surgery just to remove the fibroids um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. A lot of times as gynecologists, we think, you know, the risks associated with surgery to remove the fibroids are just as high as the risks associated with hysterectomy. So we tend to, but, but then, you know, if you don't, if you leave the uterus in place, the fibroids can always come back. And so it's um, oftentimes we'll um, counsel, you know, very carefully in that situation, but um, that is something that factors into the decision to, what to do next. So I'll talk about each of these options a little bit more. And I see, oh, there's a question in the chat. Are fibroids common in all ages or more so in younger women? That's a great question, Latrice. And they're actually more common in women of reproductive age, but nearing menopause. So like in the 40s, um, in, your, in your early to mid 40s is when we start to see most issues with fibroids starting to arise um, versus in like 20s to 30s, they're less common then. Um, and the thought is because, you know, they're, they grow in response to hormones. So you don't see them before puberty. So they haven't like developed, they should, no, no uterus before someone has reached puberty should really have fibroids, truly. But um, Kayla, yeah, this Cassandra again. I was looking at your diagram and I don't know where I fell in because um, I had a myomectomy before. Yeah. And it was because of fib fibroid tumors. But I was looking at the um, where you said desires fertility or desires uter uterine. And it wasn't that I was trying to have any more kids. So would I have fallen? But I didn't go through radiation or any of that stuff. Yeah. I just had the surgery and... That was it. So yeah. So these this diagram is mostly saying that if you even if you don't want fertility, these are some options you can consider. So you can have like if you want just to make keep your uterus in place, you could probably do either medical therapy and or radiologic therapy and or surgery to remove the fibroids, but just not a hysterectomy because that would take away the uterus. Okay, and we and we had another question. Another question. It says, are fibroids common in all ages or more so in younger women? Yeah, I had just seen that question and it's more common in your 40s. So early to mid 40s is gonna be the most common 
age group and young women, not so much. Usually in your 20s and 30s, it's just much rarer, but it still can pop up in those younger women. It's just less likely. Um, we see them because they grow under the influence of your hormones. So the long, if you think about it, just the longer time, most people don't have high levels of hormones until puberty. And then the length of time that you're exposed to those hormones is going to factor into how, when your symptoms start to present. So it's much more common to see them in women in their forties. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, they're great questions. All right. Um, so as far as treatment options go, I mentioned that there's medical therapy, there's radi radiologic therapy, and then there's surgery just on the next slide. The medical therapy, I'll, I'll go into each of these in more detail. The medical therapy is often, the first line is taking like ibuprofen. So if your problems are, I have painful, heavy periods and, um, you know, that's mostly the main symptom. Um, ibuprofen is really like NSAIDs in general are really the best medication for that. Um, there's also this medicine called tranexamic acid that stops clotting and bleeding and it helps with heavy bleeding as well. And it's an, those, an or, those are oral pills. Then there's contraceptive pills. So um, those basically, you know, we say contraceptives, but really they're just hormonal oral medications. We use them for abnormal bleeding, for heavy bleeding. Um, for a lot of reasons besides just contraceptive, like just not trying to get pregnant, but we just group them all in under that category. But we use them for so many different reasons. And that inc can include pills, it can include shots, the Depo-Provera is a shot, an IUD or an implant, those are all contraceptives. And then there are some medications, GnRH analogs. It's basically, it's similar to a contraceptive, it is basically a different type of hormone. The contraceptive works really like at the level of your uterus. The GnRH analog works more at the level of your brain and your ovaries. So it's a little like higher up on the, you know, a little pre-uterine um, in its place of action. But Lupron is probably the most common one that we sometimes use in the treatment of fibroids. And it does shrink the fibroids, but it's usually temporary. So sometimes we'll give patients these medicines like a Lupron shot to try to you know, stop their bleeding before surgery or something like that. Radiation therapy, so uterine artery or uterine fibroid embolization, also abbreviated a UAE or UFE. That's a procedure that interventional radiology does where they thread a catheter into the blood vessels, usually starting at the vein in the leg or the blood vessel in the leg, and then they thread a catheter up to the uterine artery, so the blood vessels going to the uterus. They release some beads that basically stop that blood flow, and then that is thought to help both like decrease the blood flow to the uterus and also shrink the fibroids. So um, the fibroids can shrink as a result of that procedure without having to go through surgery um, and the recovery associated with it. It's not without risk, and we'll talk about that a little bit more ahead, but that is um, another treatment option. They also have a, basically an MRI ultrasound that kind of tries to do the same thing. It's an ablation procedure of a fibroid. There's an MRI machine that focuses a really hot beam to the center of a fibroid, causes it to start dying from the inside out. Similar to the uterine artery embolization, it basically, you know, the lack of blood flow causes it to start dying from the inside out, and that's how it ends up shrinking. But these are some other procedures. Um, that are common treatment options for fibroids done by interventional radiology. And then their surgery options are myomectomy, so that's usually removing the fibroid itself, hysterectomy, removing the entire uterus. And they do have some new procedures that are also ablations, so similar to the MRRA focused ultrasound where basically you still go into the operating room, you go under anesthesia, and they place a device directly into the fibroid that causes it to heat up and start dying within. Um, so it's like a more direct um, ablation than using a external MRI beam. Um, you know, some, some places people might prefer that just because the recovery is gonna be quicker, but in our practice, my practice generally, I'm thinking if you have to go to the operating room and go under anesthesia anyway, I might as well just take your fibroid out as opposed to do this procedure to hope that it shrinks and you could be back in the OR again and um, not that much time. But 
but those are out there. You'll hear about those as well. Some people um, prefer and counsel towards those too. Um, this we already kind of talked about in, in a little bit more depth, but these are again are just the medical treatment options that I mentioned. NSAIDs you could actually take for around five days before your period and it does reduce the amount of blood loss as well as the amount of inflammation and the pain. And then I already kind of talked about these other things. So if there are any questions about medical treatment options for fibroids, like medicine, medications, if not. So this is a, I have a picture here of the uterine artery embolization or the UAE or UFE. Um, and as I mentioned before, performed by radiology, a catheter is advanced to the uterine artery and then some embolic agent is released that blocks the blood flow. Um, and what that does is it causes the uterus, the fibroid to die off the tissue that is beyond that vessel being fed by that blood vessel. Um, it kind of dies off on in the middle because it's sort of like the blood supply can't, it's, it's not enough blood to continue, to allow it to continue to grow and survive. Um, so it starts to die off. That, that process can cause a lot of pain and um, inflammation as well, but it tends to be short-lived, maybe for about a week or two. And then over time, you'll see the, uh, the fibroids and sometimes they, they, they'll start to shrink. Oh, I'm not sure who L. Lothil says mind blowing. Yeah, the picture is pretty interesting, I think. But basically, this is like the normal blood flow to um, the fibroid right here. And then once they put the beads in to block that blood flow, you can see none of this tissue is getting perfused anymore. So all of this tissue, in theory, now doesn't have the oxygen it needs. It starts to die off, but that process leads to shrinkage. And shrinkage can also, it's really a shrinkage of volume, so not specifically size. So fibroids don't always go from like 10 centimeters to four centimeters. Sometimes they shrink in volume and it might go from feeling really solid and hard like a baseball to being softer like a marshmallow. So, you know, it can improve symptoms that way as well. And then the MR focused ultrasound is very similar. Instead of threading a catheter into the blood vessel, they basically focus, uh, like I said, a high energy ultrasound wave into the center of the fibroids, try to get them to heat up and start to die off in the middle. Um, and then over time, they shrink that way. Um, they That procedure, I think, is done a little less frequently. Sometimes it depends on if it's covered. Your insurance might cover one versus the other. Um, but a lot of radiologists, interventional radiologists that I've spoken to um, think that the, the, the evidence would say, the pa papers and research would say that uterine artery embolization is probably a better treatment for fibroids than the MR focus ultrasound. Um, you know, some places will offer both and some might choose just one. I know at Northwestern, they only did the UFE just because that radiology department felt as if the outcomes were so much better that it wasn't, they didn't want to like usher people towards um, focus ultrasound when the likelihood of needing some re-intervention, meaning some other type of radiology procedure or another type of surgery in the future was just so much higher. questions about any of that. These often are not talked about as much. They, these are treatment options because the gynecologists don't do them as much. Sometimes when women go see their gynecologists, they might not have heard of these. Um, but in my specialty, minimally invasive gynecologic surgery, you know, we want to make sure we counsel them on every, everybody on every option that's out there. So I do think it's important to know, you know, sometimes people might try to adversely usher people towards surgery just because that's something that they can do themselves and get the reimbursement for. But at the end of the day, you know, these procedures are really good for certain patients, especially if you are not wanting to do surgery, but are also uh, maybe not interested in fertility. These are the ones where the effects on fertility afterwards, we're, we just don't have good evidence um, that tells us like, is this not causing any harm or any risk? Um, there's, you know, there have been normal pregnancies after both of these procedures, so we don't say that it's a contraindication, but, um, you know, it's something to consider that if you're interested in pregnancy in the future, a lot of times these might not be the best option.
Um, and then I did sort of mention, okay, maybe I was getting ahead of myself. So again, that, that there are some procedural effects, pain, sort of an inflammatory response. And sometimes you can get a short-term fever, usually just like one to two days. Oftentimes that only lasts for about a week or two. Um, and then sometimes you can have vaginal discharge if the if there was a submucosal fibroid, so a fibroid that's pushing into the uterine cavity. Sometimes like that tissue, it'll as it starts to die off, you can have discharge or you can have tissue that like, start to pass through the vagina. Um, so typically if we see a big fibroid inside of the uterus in the submucosal region, we may not, um, you know, always, always do this procedure. Um, and that is, there is an increase in the risk of infection when that's the case as well. Um, but yes, yeah, some, some data may say that these radiologic procedures could increase the miscarriage rate. And then there's a theoretical risk. You know, if we're cutting off part of the blood flow to the uterus, how does a baby grow? How does the placenta get the blood flow that it needs to have a normal um, pregnancy. Those are more theoretical. They haven't, there's no good studies to say that that's for sure the case, but there's the concern that they could be impacting those things. And then I think this is the last section I have. I know we're running short on time, but this is talking about the surgical options. Um, that's, you're fine. That's, okay. that's fine. Okay. Um, so surgery to remove the fibroids is a myomectomy. Surgery to remove the entire uterus is a hysterectomy. So these are sort of the final definitive treatments for uterine fibroids. Removing the uterine fibroids themselves preserves the uterus, preserves fertility, and there are a couple different approaches that we can do that by. So if the uterus is submucosal, sometimes there's a, a vaginal approach to removing a fibroid. Usually the fibroids have to be small enough to be able to come through the cervix, um, but that is an option. And then there's um, ideally, you know, getting the fibroids out through a laparoscopy. So that's a minimally invasive procedure and a couple slides I have after this will kind of um, explain that a little bit more, but um, there's the, you know, sometimes we can move, remove fibroids through smaller incisions and, um, uh, basically take them off the uterus with long instruments and then just like use a small incision to take the tissue out versus sometimes you have to make a bigger incision. And that's always something that we hope to avoid, you know, a laparotomy basically is a bigger like a C-section type incision or even an up and down incision. Um, those have a higher risk of blood loss and um, bleeding complications of infection. Um, so a minimally invasive procedure to remove fibroids would be a laparoscopic or a hysteroscopic one, or even a mini, mini laparotomy. So like a four to six centimeter incision. Hysterectomy is usually reserved for patients that have either completed childbearing, or if you've failed, like you've tried a myomectomy multiple times, your symptoms are still really bothersome to you. Then oftentimes hysterectomy, again, is the most definitive answer. Um, the most common route of hysterectomy done nowadays is a laparoscopic one, especially for fibroids. Vaginal hysterectomies have the lowest complication risk, but once the uterus gets to a certain size, it can be harder to remove all of the tissue vaginally. So that means vaginal hysterectomy means there are no incisions on the abdomen at all, like the entire surgery is done through the vagina. Laparoscopic hysterectomy, you do, you'd have like a couple small, usually three or four small incisions on your abdomen. And the uterus is still removed through the vagina, but you have the instruments going through your abdominal through up top as well. And then an abdominal or an open um, hysterectomy is by a laparotomy, so removing the uterus. Usually if it's very large, like above the, um, the belly button or at least 20 week size or more. So this is just a picture of what a hysteroscopy is. Again, that this is a patient lying flat, like on a bed, and there's a speculum in place. This hysteroscope is a camera that you can place an instrument in and out of that is inserted into the uterine cavity, so into the endometrial cavity. So fibroids that are submucosal pushing into this space, only those are able sometimes to be removed by a hysteroscopic or a vaginal approach. Um, fibroids that are in the muscle layer of the uterus or that are on the outside, like the subserosal side, so like pushing onto the abdominal, into the in abdominal cavity are not able to be removed this way. But this is a low risk procedure. It's usually like a same day surgery. 
um, come in and out under mild sedation. Recovery is very mild. And so um, with the heavy bleeding that can sometimes be caused by the smaller fibroids that are inside of the uterus, um, you know, those always should be evaluated and there may be some very straightforward treatments for removing that. A laparoscopy, on the other hand, is the minimally invasive approach where we place a camera typically in the belly button. And like I mentioned, three or four smaller incisions on the other parts of the, like on either side of your belly, place these little trocars into the abdomen. And then we use long instruments. So like a handle that they open and close and we can pick up tissue. We can um, cut off things, uh, like cut off a fibroid or remove it from, from um, the uterus. That way we can sew laparoscopically um, and close all incisions. And then usually to get the tissue out, we have to extend one of those incisions to maybe like this size, three to two to three centimeters or so. Um, but the recovery from a laparoscopic surgery is, is much um, lower than from a bigger incision. And that's sort of um, one of the big benefits of a minimally invasive gynecologist. Yes. We have another question and I can I can answer the question, but I'm going to give it to you. Uh, so, uh, someone wants to know, does fibroids affect your sex life? That is a great question. And the answer is they can. So it depends on the person. Um, oh, sorry. They're it, painful. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. And it depends. Like maybe if they're very small fibroids just within the muscle, maybe not. But if you have large fibroids, um, it, it is, and sometimes the, um, it just makes sex uncomfortable. Um, sometimes it can cause pain. It really depends on a lot of factors. The type of intercourse you have, like your, the type of partner you have, um, whether it's penetrative or not, you know, all of those things are factors. Um, but I will say that, you know, some women will say, I, I know I have this fibroid and then I know it's on the right side. And then every time I have sex, I feel like I have pain on the right side, you know, so probably, you know, um, but as far as there's a lot of other things that can also cause um, pain during sex or cause some, you know, discomfort or dysfunction in sex, just your relationship with the partner, lubrication, all of that can change too after menopause, like the tissue itself. So we always encourage women to like look and evaluate and make sure there are other reasons. Like I wouldn't just like automatically say it's the fibroids, but it definitely can be the fibroids. <laughs> so um, if that's a symptom that you're having and bothered by, it's always a good idea to touch base with your gynecologist and maybe do an ultrasound, make sure that fibroids, if they're there, um, you know, are addressed. That's a great question. Um, so this is sort of talking about, again, the benefits of an open surgery. So historically, maybe, you know, 20, 30 years ago, anyone that had fibroid surgery was getting an up and down incision like this. Um, but that has really fallen out of favor. Nowadays, really the standard of care for a lot of these types of procedures, um, maybe, maybe less, it depends on the size of the fibroids for sure. Um, but any cysts, taking out cysts from the ovaries, taking the uterus out, hysterectomies, they are most commonly done by laparoscopy and through small incisions. So imagine like if you have one big open incision like that, just the amount of time it takes to recover. I think that's on my next slide. They, they have a lot higher blood loss, those big incisions. So minimally invasive or laparoscopic procedures have a less blood loss, shorter length of stay in the hospital. A lot of times after a laparoscopic procedure, we send patients home the same day. So you don't have to stay in the hospital, but with a big open incision, there's a lot of nerves that have been cut. There's a lot more bleeding and, and that sort of thing, the recovery. It just takes longer for you to get back on your feet longer for your pain to become controlled. So oftentimes that is like an inpatient admission, sometimes for days, um, even weeks. There's um, again, less pain with the laparoscopic surgery, faster recovery, decreased complications, particularly infection and um, wound healing complications are dramatically reduced with a minimally invasive surgery. So again, we always encourage, and, and that's why I went into my fellowship. My fellowship is in minimally invasive gynecologic surgery because I see the benefits of giving all of these things to more and more patients, even though, you know, our a generation or two, they had never done any laparoscopy because it only came about in the 80s, but now it's really becoming the standard of care. 
And even more so now we have robotic surgery, which is like a adjunct to laparoscopic surgery um, that allows us to do even more types of um, complicated gynecologic procedures through a minimally invasive approach. So the robot, the surgeon actually sits here at the console. This is what's attached. It's uh, brought up to the patient table. And these arms have instruments that are inserted usually under a camera um, inside like our laparoscopic instruments would be. And then the surgeon can control this machine from this console. You can see the picture, the rest of the OR team can see what's going on inside on these screens and hook all the instruments are hooked up to these like energy sources and things. But this is really, um, really just radically changed um, a lot of different gynecologic surgery procedures. Endometrial cancer used to all be done by open surgeries until the robot was developed. Now for endometrial cancer, it's usually contained within the uterus. So the standard of care is really to take it out through a minimally invasive surgery. So that's um, something to consider if you or friends are ever interested in having any procedures done, hysterectomy, uterine fibroid surgery, whether they can do it through a minimally invasive approach. And if so, you know, maybe using the robot is appropriate if they aren't as comfortable with laparoscopy, but anyone that's able to not make a big up and down incision, if that, if it's, if you're a candidate for it, um, you know, hopefully that is something they should be offered. Um, some of the advantages of the robot, again, you have better visualization. What the, like the lap, traditional laparoscopy, basically your instruments do this. They open and they close. The robotic instruments have a little wrist. So it gives you a lot more um, flexibility from a surgeon standpoint. It removes a tremor, like I'm holding the instruments myself when I'm doing a laparoscopy with the robot. Again, it, you saw that it's that big machine that's docked. And then the ergonomics for the surgeon, we're sitting at a console that's adjusted to our height and eye level. Um, those are better. Of course, the disadvantage is that it costs more, usually for the hospital, not always dramatically more for the patient. A lot of times uh, the hospital um, just has to do enough surgery to fund the robot and then that doesn't always get translated to the patient, but um, um, it requires additional training and then you can't always tell, like you can't, you don't get that tactile feedback, that's the haptics that this is talking about. When I touch something with an instrument, I can feel is this hard, is this soft? It's a little harder to do with the robot. You don't get the tactile feedback visually, you can kind of tell if you're, you know, skilled enough to have done robotic surgery, but um, that's one of the disadvantages. So now we have all of these three routes. And in, in addition to purely vaginal procedures, which is no scars on the abdomen. Um, and um, these are things that should, like I mentioned before, just be offered to patients on a, um, that are requiring hysterectomy or myomectomy. I believe that, oh, Couple of last points. This is the last section, actually. Fibroids in pregnancy, I sort of mentioned. If you have fibroids and then you subsequently get pregnant, there can be symptoms. Most commonly, they don't cause any symptoms, but sometimes the fibroid can grow in pregnancy, can cause pain. And we always try to avoid, you know, taking the fibroid out during pregnancy. Um, if you have a uh, fibroid surgery, a lot of times, you know, carrying a pregnancy. Um, there's a risk of that scar on the uterus not having healed correctly and it can open up. So sometimes you might be, it might be recommended that you get a C-section for any future pregnancies after a fibroid is removed. And that sort of depends on how the surgery goes, but it's often um, one of the things that's typically recommended um, just because there, we would never want you to labor against that scar tissue and have that open up because that could be pretty catastrophic. Um, I think I sort of mentioned like, yes, the fiber can grow in pregnancy, it can cause pain in pregnancy, and then there are the risks that it can be associated with miscarriage, particularly the ones that are in the endometrial cavity under the placenta. Sometimes they can cause preterm labor or abnormal contractions, so a dysfunctional labor, um, but those are some of the things we sometimes see with fiber in pregnancy, not always. I think that is finally all that I have. And these are some references, but I'm happy to take any questions that any of you ladies may have that you didn't ask along the way. I appreciate you asking. <clears throat>
Well, the young lady that had all of the questions, mm -hmm. <laughs> she posted them already, but I think um, LaShawn may have a few questions for you. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Nixon, uh, for an amazing presentation. And you just kind of took me back uh, to my experience years ago in my 20s. It, it all started in my 20s and uh, it runs in my family. My mom had it. And so I had those fibroids and it uh, started in high school and then in, into college and uh, my family was concerned that if I went off to college, would I be um, successful? Because in high school, every my teachers knew um, exactly during every month that I had to miss school because I was in bed, throwing up everything, uh, in pain. Uh, that's just how serious it was for every month. I mean, my teachers knew exactly why I was absent uh, for two days every month. Um, 